All right, let's just ask the Lord's blessing once more. Heavenly Father, we again ask you to grace us here with your presence, your continued presence, and enlighten our minds and show us what your word is trying to teach us. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings, and thank you that you are always willing to bend your ear to hear our requests. We pray now for your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right, let's have a brief look at this millennial story, the long-awaited millennium. And uh, let me try and recap what we've done thus far. Millennialism that is taught in the world out there can be divided into the following categories. One of the most prominent is amillennialism. In actual fact, that's probably the biggest group. There's no specific period of a thousand year reign. The period applies to the whole church history. This is the view that is held by Roman Catholicism and some conservative Protestant groups. So there is no millennium. It just is a general term applying to everything. The other view that is held is post-millennialism. This view claims that the kingdom is a present reality because Christ reigns in his church. All nations will be converted to Christ prior to the coming of Christ. And the period prior to his coming will become peaceful and the gospel will be spread to all nations. And uh, we've seen from the texts of the previous lecture on the coming of Christ that none of this is biblical. Both the Lutheran Augsburg Confession and the Puritan Westminster Confession subscribe to this view. And they all say that all the nations will be converted to Christ and that the kingdom is a present reality. Well, if this is the kingdom of Christ, I really don't want it. So this is problematic. Amillennialism, the Bible clearly speaks about a millennium. A thousand years and post-millennialism doesn't make any sense. What about premillennialism, dispensational premillennialism? That teaches the secret rapture or a rapture in general, but it leaves the living, wicked, alive here on earth, converted to Christ all of a sudden. And we saw that that is not biblical because when Christ comes, he severs the righteous from the wicked and the wicked are destroyed, right? Well, that doesn't make sense. The Millennium Kingdom reaches its fulfillment in the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation, the temple, the sacrificial system are restored in Palestine. What for? If you sacrifice animals, you are saying Christ has not come in the flesh. Is that not so? But Christ is fulfillment of the sacrificial system. So that doesn't make any sense. All the warnings given to the church regarding the time of trouble prior to the coming of Christ now become applicable to the Jews only. So why would we even bother reading our Bible? We might as well just, you know, sing and be happy. As do Matthew 24, that doesn't apply. And when Jesus say, pray, thy kingdom come, what for? Doesn't make any sense, it only applies to the Jews and all the teachings regarding that kingdom. And then you have historic premillennialism, the redeemed of all ages on earth during the millennium. The church is the Israel of God, comprising all the peoples of God, and the millennial period constitutes the first thousand years of God's kingdom on the earth. That's not biblical. Because clearly the Bible said Christ returns, severs the just from the wicked and the righteous, meet him in the air, they're taken away and the rest are like dung on the ground and the others don't rise. Isn't that correct? So none of these teachings that are taught in the world today can be substantiated if you are going to use all the biblical texts. And then, if you don't do that, then the Bible is not in harmony. And I cannot work with a Bible that is in disharmony with itself. That makes no sense. Would you agree? So the end of the world, as we know it, people were saying, oh, we're going into the new millennium, 
and we're going to get, you know, all these fearful things coming. Computers are going to go crazy and all these things and the preachers were going crazy, Jerry Falwell and all the big preachers were saying this and that and the other is going to happen and nothing happened. <laughs> nothing happened and it wouldn't happen. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, which is another parallel for angels. And I will be like the Most High, Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. The devil wants all the attributes of God and he wants worship, just like God receives worship. And so he has set up on this earth a counterfeit system and to divert the minds from the true religion of salvation in Christ and obedience to his commandments. He has taken all of that, jumbled it up, served half gospels to the people and diverted their eyes from the consequences of not following Christ. Brilliant. He's got it sewn up. Well, let's have a look. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the morning? Interesting. He calls himself Lucifer. Thou, how art thou cut down to the ground, that didst lay low the nations? And thou saidst in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of congregation in the uttermost parts of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Six times he uses this personal I, myself. Six times. In the modern translations that gets totally lost. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11:14. He presents himself as Lucifer directly to his direct servants and as Christ to his deluded servants. That's very sad, very sad indeed. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We have a serious enemy here. He has lied and lied from the beginning, and people have swallowed the lie. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. So here we have this tremendous deception, this war going on in this world, Revelation 12, 12. We also learnt in the series that we did that the devil wants to receive worship, but he uses the earthly powers and systems in order to receive that worship. He has his high individuals to whom he reveals himself personally. You find that in deep seances and uh, Luciferian worship. But the dragon gave the sea beast, Rome, Roman Catholicism, his seat and great authority. Revelation 13, 2. So he works through the system. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. Now who wanted to do that? The devil wanted to do that. He wanted to get rid of the government of God and to replace it with his own government. And he's using the papal Roman system to do that. There's their own decretal de translat episcop. That's their own statement. So the pagan high priest of Lucifer is the one who says, I will change the precepts of Christ. I'll do it. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of the Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Catholic record, September 1, 1923. He attacks the heart of the law of God, which contains the seal of God, the authority of God. 
So he says, not you will make the laws, not your seal, mine. You say, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Six days shall you labor and do all your work? For in six days the Lord created the heavens, the earth, you know, you and your daughter and your whatever. He says, not you, not you the creator, me, the great architect of the universe. That's what he calls himself, arrogant. Read it on the top of your Masonic temples. The great architect of the universe. I make the laws around here. Sabbath is your mark. Sunday is ours. Sunday is our mark of authority. We're above the Bible. We transferred it. And we are mighty. We can do it. And the world follows them. And the occult high priest of the world, he is above Jesus Christ. He can do whatever he likes. And then we studied the sad fact that the Reformation would eventually capitulate and that a second beast would rise out of the earth at the time when the first beast receives a mortal wound. The date, 1798, in that same year, France recognizes the United States as an independent, sovereign country. And the Bible tells us that this lamb-like beast, which has a lamb-like constitution, freedom and liberty for all, would speak like a dragon and force everyone to accept the mark of the first beast. And they've just told us that that is Sunday in forced worship to the exclusion of the Sabbath day. So worship me and not God, says the devil. And he's using the world religious systems to do it. Sad. So the goddess on top of the Capitol, designed by James Hoban, the image of the beast becomes a persecuting power just like the first beast was a persecuting power, and the second beast enforces the worship of the first beast by making laws which were made by the first beast against the law of God. They've told us what it was. We can change the precepts of Christ. We can change the laws. We have replaced Sabbath with Sunday, and you are going to obey us, and this power will force everyone to do it. That's what the Bible teaches. Then came the Holy Alliance, the Masonic finger showing that the two countries become one in terms of their goals and motives. And then he causes all this is the second beast, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. You either do or you believe, doesn't matter, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark. Economic boycotts. And they have the control of the entire economy, they have the control of every finance. They have no problem doing it. Or the number of his name. Revelation 13, 16, and 17. Ezekiel 20, 12, and 20 said, Hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Hearken unto me that you know ye that know righteousness. In other words, what is right? What is God's character? The people in whose heart is my law. And the new covenant is God's law written in the hearts. Fear ye not the reproach of men. When they say you will do this, you will not buy nor sell, do you have to be afraid? No. Nope. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. Isaiah 51, 7, don't be afraid, but it's going to come. James 2, 10 to 12, For whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. People say, it's not important whether you keep the Sabbath on this day or that day. No, 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 no. Because the Sabbath 
is the sign of your allegiance to the authority of the whole law. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, that shall be judged by the law of liberty. This law of God is going to judge. It's going to say who is guilty and who is not guilty. Better to be on the side of God's law than on the side of man's law, right or wrong? James 2, 10 to 12. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. How many of them? All ten. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. The whole Bible is in harmony on this question. Don't mess with God. Don't mess with His authority. Don't mess with His law. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world. Now what was the standard of judgment? We just read it. The law of liberty, which is the Ten Commandments. Uh, true liberty consists in obedience to God's commandments. Then there'll be nothing to be afraid of out there. Nobody's going to kill you. Nobody's going to steal your things. Nobody's going to steal your wife. Nobody's going to covet. Nobody's going to make you a slave. What a great world it would be. Righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, Jesus. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Acts 17, 31. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. Ecclesiastes 3, 17. God will judge. He will judge. And where does judgment begin? begins with God's people. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begins at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? 1 Peter 4.17 Don't be complacent if you belong to God's people. Don't be complacent if you keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, but you do not live it in its fullness and you are just having a form religion. Because when the tempest comes, you will be blown away. Fix your motives and your love on things above, not on things below. Because judgment is going to begin with the house of God. Because when Christ returns, his reward is with him. So when did the judgment take place that Christ did? Before he returns or afterwards? Must be before. Because when he comes, he sends out his angels, and they will sever the wicked from the just, and each one receives his reward according as he has done. The righteous are and taken to heaven, and the wicked are destroyed. So surely before Christ comes, there must have been a judgment to determine who is righteous and who is not, right or wrong. So there must be some investigation in heaven to determine this, an investigative judgment to see who is there and who is not. And then a decree goes out, he who is righteous, let him remain righteous, and he who is wicked, let him remain wicked. So when we are judged, God reveals our character to us, character to us, and chastens us that we might be refined. Some people think the judgment is like this. I accept Jesus Christ in my, as my personal Savior, and now I come into judgment. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a wonderful thing. All my sins go ahead of me to the sanctuary. We dealt with that lecture on the sanctuary. All of them go to the sanctuary. Everyone that I confess and leave goes to the sanctuary. And Christ reveals to me my character. That is called justification. The first one, when I come to Christ, and this revelation is called sanctification. And more and more I realize how far out of line I am with him. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. See? comes together. So the Lord shows me 
And how does he do it? Well, he puts me into the melting pot. One of the greatest melting pots on this earth is a marriage relationship. You know that? Beautiful melting pot. And most people run away from it. But nothing can reveal your faults as much as the one that you love. Amen. Who cares about the one who hates you in any case, right? Ah, poof, bye, get lost, that's what we say. But you can't do that to the one you love. You can't say, bye. <laughs> no, no, no. They are great revealers of your faults. They're pretty good at it. Irritating, but nevertheless. <laughs> when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. And you know what? There's nothing that chastens as much as the tear out of one that you love. So you can be far away from anyone. If you have a love relationship with Jesus Christ, you will know what hurts him and what brings a tear to his eye as well. It doesn't have to be someone on this earth necessarily. But uh, nothing can make a man think about himself as much as the tear in someone else's eye. So the Lord chastens you and you say, Lord, I don't want to be like I was before. I don't want to be as harsh as I was. I used to be so harsh. I loved, I loved my family and I loved my wife like I cannot say. But I was harsh on them sometimes. And I had a temper that was, wow, unbelievable. I, I don't want to be like that, Lord. Take it away. That we may not be condemned with the world. And so the Lord works on our characters. So judgment, you come into judgment when you accept Jesus Christ. And the Lord helps you over this as you stumble along in your life and he refines you as with the refiner's fire. And it's not something where you stand up at the end of the day and say, wow, look how nice and smart and clean I am. In fact, the more he reveals to you about yourself, the more you realize how far off the mark you are. And uh, the smaller you become in your own sight, the better. And then, the Lord has a warning for this world. And it is written as the three angels' messages. The first angel's message, written in Revelation 14, 6, says that the time of his judgment has come. And it says something about the everlasting gospel, that the everlasting gospel will be preached to every tribe and nation upon the earth. An hour of judgment has come. So the full gospel, which entails salvation in Christ by grace alone, but as a consequence of the grace revealed, an alignment with the law of God. I accept Christ as my Savior and as my King I am obedient to him. That's the full gospel. A half gospel will say, accept Jesus and live like you lived before. No, Jesus said, go and sin no more. So that's the everlasting gospel that must be preached. And the hour of judgment has come. Judgment. A second angel says, Babylon has fallen. That means that this message that goes to the world must define who Babylon is. It must say who the beast is, who the false prophet is, and who the dragon is, and must expose it for what it is. Have we done this in the lectures here in this hall? Yes or no? All right. And the third angel says, do not accept the mark of the beast. Have we done that? Yes. So this message is going out to the world. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So this message goes to the world, and then the final events that we spoke of in the last lectures will take place. He cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, fallen, and she's become a house, you know, of demons and unclean birds and all of these things. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. God's people, must they separate from everything that binds them? Yes, they must come out. Who do they come out to? What do they come out to? We have to look at this. They have to accept the full gospel of Jesus Christ so that they will not receive the plagues. God had a people in the time of 
the Egyptian plagues, and God has a people at the end of time, consisting of how many nations and tribes? All of them. All of them. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. And these go to deceive the whole world, the Bible says. And then comes the day of God, the day of the Almighty, the great day, the second coming, Revelation 16, 13, and 14. And during this terrible confrontation at the end of time, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. No half gospel. You cannot adhere to a half gospel. If you accept Jesus Christ, it's a package deal. Obedience comes along with it. You cannot say, once saved, always saved. And you cannot say, Jesus paid it all, I can continue in sin. You cannot do that. The decree goes out, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Revelation 22, 11. And then comes this terrible time of trouble that we dealt with in the last lecture on the coming of Christ. Since there was a nation, and during this time, God intervenes. There will be violence, 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 violence. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Revelation 15, 1. So God pours out the plagues on the earth. God's people are still here because Christ has not yet returned. The first plague hits the earth, the second, the sea, the third, the fountains and the rivers, and they turn to blood. Did that happen in Egypt? Yes. It was a type. We have an anti-type. How it will happen, whether it will just bring all natural disasters to a head, I don't know. I am not God, but I know that the water will stink, and that the fields will be dry, and men will be battling to survive. The sun will scourge men. I don't know whether the ozone layer is going to be wiped out. I don't know which way it's going to be, but the sun is going to scorch people. But God's people will be divinely protected. That is the beauty of it. And then the fifth plague is poured out on the throne of the beast. And the beast, we know, is Catholicism. So there will be special attention paid to that system. It will not be destroyed during the fifth plague, but it will receive special attention. That should be something. And the sixth is poured out on the Euphrates. Now, is that the literal Euphrates? Well, the rivers already had their plague in the beginning there, so what does the Euphrates stand for? The Euphrates stands for the river that fed Babylon, and the waters in the Bible are the peoples, the nations, the multitudes, and kings. Noticing that the world had been deceived, the plagues are falling, just as the Egyptians severed themselves from Egypt, so will they try to sever themselves from the beast. But they cannot. Why not? Because there's no probation. Probation has closed. When the plagues fall, there's no probation. And so, in a final effort to gain the ascendancy, Satan brings out the death decree. So prior to this time, there was no buying and selling and economic and terrible pressure on the people of God, but now comes a death decree. And who knows, they say, Midnight, Standard Eastern Time, whatever the date is. It's interesting that the Bible says it was at midnight that Christ returns. You have the midnight this, the midnight that, and it was midnight. Very interesting. So, then comes the final plague, and it's poured out in the air, and you have the great earthquake, and the Bible says that during that earthquake, all the cities of the world are flattened, and the hail comes and falls on the people. 
obviously the people of God must be away. So the seventh plague, in the sense, is the battle of Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial in the air, and there came the great voice of the temple of heaven, that is the voice of Christ, the voice of the archangel, which does what to the dead? Raises them from the dead and translates the righteous, and the angels sever the righteous from the just, they're taken up into the air, and then this earthquake and the hail destroys the world from the throne saying, it is done, it's finished, it's over. Revelation 16, 7. Now, during these plagues, the Bible said in Psalm 91, as we saw, no evil shall befall thee, no plague come near thy dwelling. God's people will be divinely protected during that time. Isaiah 26, 21. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee, hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. God's people are here, the plagues are falling, God's people must do what? From the wrath and the persecution against those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony and refuse to accept the mark of the beast. What must they do? What's the Bible say? Hide yourself from a, for a little while. Flee. What happened in the time of Jerusalem? The Bible says that when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, and the parallel text in Luke says, when you see the armies surrounding Jerusalem, in other words, when you see the military and the police powers of the world attacking spiritual Israel, God's people, flee. Get out. Go hide. Wherever. In the solitary places of the world, wherever that is, God will open the doors, open the way. But we have to listen. Shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. So, get away from it as much as you can. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So just prior to the coming of the Lord, God's people will have to choose hidden places. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as it is from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, who are we talking about here? We're talking about the one who makes the laws. We're talking about the one who is supported by Satan. And in a sense, it also talks about Satan directly. The man of sin is the beast power, who changes the law of God, but he represents Satan, so in a sense it's also Satan. And he must be revealed for what he is. And then only will the gathering take place, not before. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery, that mystery religion, of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawlessness one will be revealed. So God is holding the winds and allows evil to reveal itself. Become so great that you should see it. Whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So the system will be put to an end. So this man of sin represents the beast power. It does not represent the dragon directly. The dra dragon gives him his power. Catholicism and everything that pertains to it 
will be destroyed. The coming of the lawless one is according to the works of Satan, with all power. So the lawless one is according to the works of Satan. And lying wonders with all unrighteous deceptions amongst those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. That's the sad situation we have on our planet today, with all these religions preaching half gospels, half truths, and just blatant lies. Isaiah 34, 4, 35, 4. Say to them that are fearful, of fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your Lord will come with vengeance. Even God with recompense, He will come and save you. Is there anything to be afraid of? No. We need an experience with Christ right now. Yeah. Let me tell you one thing. Since I have become a Christian, I have often come into the situation where I did not know whether I have any opportunity of solving some of the crises that I was in. And God has always solved them in the very last second. Do you know how irritating that is? <laughs> how nerve-wracking that is? And how often I've pleaded with God and said, how can you do this to me? Well, let me tell you something. If he didn't do it to me, I would have no experience to cope with this. Because God is going to intervene in the very last second. So start trusting him. And when things are really bad, then lift up your eyes and say, now I'm wondering how the Lord's going to solve this mess. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Isaiah 41, 13. Do we have to be afraid? No. Christ will come, and he will fulfill his problem. So Revelation's central themes, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even as the lightning is seen from the east to the west. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his angels, of his Father's glory. The whole Godhood comes with him. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. We haven't done that yet, have we? No, we've just looked at the resurrection of life. And between the two there was, how long a period? A thousand years. So the resurrection of life takes place when Christ comes, fights the battle of Armageddon, and those that are in Christ are taken away. Now what about the resurrection of damnation? We have to solve that one. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2.13 Titus. That's the first resurrection. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. If you are alive and you are blind, you will be able to see because you'll be transformed instantly. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. All disease, everything will just fall away. No more cripples, no more pain, no more dying. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's the biblical gospel. And we shall be changed, for this corruptible, that which could die, must no longer die. The mortal will put on immortality. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. And we which are alive, together with the others, will meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. The righteous go to heaven. Right. Let's just recap what happens to the dead. The wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? Revelation 6, 17. They hide themselves in the rocks and the mountains, and they say to the rocks, Fall on us, fall on us, and hide us from him that sit us on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. So they die. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute the kings on that day. He will judge the nations. He shall execute the heads of many countries, and he'll fill the places with dead bodies. That's Armageddon, 110, verse 5 and 6. 
Now we've lost the last time we read what Satan said he wanted to do. Now let's see what the Lord's going to do, because this is very interesting. This is the reverse text. This is Micah 5, 10 to 15. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord. Satan had how many eyes? Six. Eight is the number of Christ. I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee. That's the military power. I will destroy thy chariots. I will cut off the cities of thy land. That's the third eye. And throw down all thy strongholds. I will cut off witchcraft, masonry, repent. Out of thine hand, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. So all those advisers to the presidents, listen up. Thy graven images will I cut off, and thy standing images, Catholicism, listen, out of the midst of thee, and thou shalt no more worship the work of thy hands. Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, listen. And I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee, all the secret worship places, and I will destroy thy cities, and I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. There are eight eyes there that are going to counteract the six eyes of Lucifer. The wicked living are slain, the religious lie will be laid to rest, the planet goes into a state of void. Satan remains alive because only the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the fire. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that is the old serpent, which is the devil, so you can't make a mistake, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Revelation 20, 1 and 2. So did he get a big chain around him now, and now he sits over here? Well, how does it work? Well, you see, all the nations are dead. Everybody is dead, and the righteous are all gone. Where are they? They were the Lord. Satan is bound in chains of circumstances for a thousand years. Let's read some of these parallel texts. Psalm 68, 6. God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains. Are those literal chains or chains of circumstance? But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. So these chains of circumstance bound people God is going to bound, bind Satan. And then there is a millennium. Mili anos, a thousand years. I behold, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger, Jeremiah 4.26. This earth is desolate. There's no one alive on it. Every city is gone. Every living thing is gone. Desolate cities, that's all that's on this planet. The slain of the Lord shall be that day from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth, and they shall not be lamented, there's no one to lament them, neither be gathered, there's no one to gather them. They shall be dung upon the ground. They will not be buried. Jeremiah 25, 33. So, when Jesus returns, the righteous living ascend, the righteous dead are resurrected, the wicked living are slain, and the rest of the dead live not until the thousand years were finished, Revelation 25. So for a thousand years, the wicked that were slain are like dung, and the others remain dead. So the first resurrection and the second resurrection are separated by a thousand years. That's been known as the millennium. There is no question that there is a millennium of peace here. There's no question that the nations are reigning in peace and serving Jesus down here. There's nothing there. That's what the Bible teaches. Did you know that not one single denomination out there teaches that? Isn't that interesting? So our day, the first resurrection, Jesus returns. The earth is desolate because Satan is also bound at this time. He's got nothing to do, no one to deceive. And the earth is abusos, without form and void. Genesis 1-2 returns to its chaotic state. And there it is. 
for a thousand years. The earth is torn up. Darkened condition is the bottomless pit where Satan will be forced to stay for a thousand years. He can look at the dung, he can look at the destruction, and he can contemplate his works. Now what happens with the righteous during the millennium? They were resurrected, they are now immortal, and they are with Christ. Revelation 26 says, They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Where? In heaven. In heaven. Because Christ said, I am going to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again so that you may be where I am also. Do you remember that text? So up there in heaven is a city of God, and the righteous are taken to the city of God, and they enter into the city of God, and they reign as priests with God for a thousand years. That's what the Bible teaches. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. Revelation 24. Now, did Jesus judge the world before he came, yes or no? Yes. Obviously, otherwise he couldn't have decided who the righteous were and who the unrighteous were, right? So what judgment is now given to the saints? The books are laid open. Wow! Jesus is going to say, you are wondering why my judgment turned out like it was. Maybe you are wondering, where's so-and-so? Why is so-and-so not here? And what's that guy doing here? That was a wicked guy. What's he doing here? Right? You'll have thousands and thousands of questions. And Jesus Christ will say, this is how it was. See for yourselves if my judgment was righteous. Judge for yourselves. So all the books are laid open, and the priests of God will judge what is right and what is wrong. The standard of judgment, of course, the law of God. They will check it out. They will see. I don't know what it'll be like. Maybe there will be super 3D videos where you can see exactly what was whispered in the secret places. Who knows? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we will judge angels? 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. So the demons that are down here and Satan that is bound, will we be able to see from the beginning, from the war in heaven, right down to that battle of Armageddon, what he did and how he deceived? Yes or no? Yes. And at the end of it, it will be absolutely clear that God's judgment is righteous. Because the saints will all declare, true and just are your judgments. They will be able to verify. I call it the judgment of verification. Verifying that Christ's judgment were just. And the evil one will be judged by the saints. That irritates him. Do you know that? That bugs him. So the judgment reveals that God has done everything he can to save every single individual. Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Revelation 16, 7. That's what the saints will say. They will say, there is not a shadow of doubt. God was just. So during the millennium, the righteous are in heaven, the earth is desolate, Satan is bound, and the judgment of verification takes place in heaven. Why does that take a thousand years? Well, there's six thousand years of history to go through, and then there is a transformation. There's an instant transformation when we are changed. But we are not robots. We are what we are. And we have to 
grow in understanding. And there will be people there who were maybe blind their entire lives, or who were cripples their entire lives, or who were brain cabbages their entire lives. They will have to grow and be nurtured and in, informed and understand all these things and the healing of the nations. It'll be a tremendous time with Christ. Every question we ever asked can be asked of God himself. So when we come to the four comings of Christ, we've dealt with the coming of Christ as a babe. We've dealt with the coming to the Ancient of Days, the close of probation. We've dealt with the coming in glory. That's when the Battle of Armageddon took place. But then there is another coming in the Bible which will restore the earth and set up the kingdom. Because the kingdom is not up there in heaven. The kingdom will be down here on this earth. The rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were finished. They must be resurrected. That takes place down here on earth. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosened out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations. Revelation 27. Now what bound him? The fact that they were all dead. There was nothing to deceive. Now, who is the author of life? Christ or Satan? Satan is not the author of life. He doesn't have life in himself. What's dead, he cannot resurrect. But Christ can. So Christ has to resurrect the wicked. And he resurrects them. So that implies Christ returns. He resurrects them. And Satan sees his thousands upon thousands times ten thousands and thousands of thousands, his billions of deceived ones rising from the dead. And he sees his, who knows, Napoleons and whoever they all are that defied the armies of the living God, and he says, let's go for it. So you have the resurrection of damnation. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Did his feet touch this earth when he came the second time? Yes or no? No. Everybody met him in the air. So now he comes down, he touches the Mount of Olives and it becomes a great plain which is before Jerusalem in the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be cleaved in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west, and there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall be removed towards the north and half of it towards the south. Zechariah 14, 3 and 4. So here's another coming of Christ that did not fit into any of the previous ones. He comes down, he touches the earth, it becomes a great plain. And onto this plain, the city descends. Wow, Independence Day looks like nothing compared to this. Revelation 21, 2, And I, John saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So down comes the new city onto the plain that has been cleansed by the touch of Christ. <laughs> there it stands. And the wicked rise. Now where are the wicked? Inside or outside the city? Outside the city. And Satan sees the city of God, and he sees his host, and he says, I have a chance, and he goes out to deceive them. The city is described as so magnificent, nobody would be able to even comprehend what it's like. As high as it is wide, and it is streets of gold, fine gold, that means transparent gold. It's like crystal and jasper. And inside it is the river of life and the tree of life and the garden restored, the garden of Eden. Everything is in there. So the Bible teaches the first resurrection, Jesus returns, the earth desolate, that's the millennium. Then judgment takes place in heaven, the judgment of verification. Then it teaches the second resurrection, the holy city descends, and the earth must be made new because it's lying waste. 
Revelation 27. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. That can only happen when the wicked rise. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are on the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. So we had a war when Christ came. That battle was called what? Armageddon. Now we have another war, and that war is called Gog and Magog. So when Christ destroys his enemies, that is called a war. So here we have another battle, the battle with Gog and Magog. And when you read the story of Gog, and you read it there in Ezekiel, you will find that Gog and Magog is a symbol of Satan. All the attributes of Lucifer are in there. Because there is one that has not yet been destroyed, who has not died once yet. Who was that? Satan and his angels. So the wicked rise. Why do the wicked have to rise again? They have to face the consequences cognitively of their actions. They must see for themselves those that have been saved versus those that are not. And the righteous must see that the wicked truly, in total, are anti-Jesus Christ. You might think, but Lord, if so-and-so, why so-and-so not here? And the Lord says, that person is not converted in his heart. Look at the record. And you think, wow, I thought that was such a good person. And the Lord says, that person hates with a hatred that you cannot imagine. You say, really, Lord? When you see that person rise and stand outside the city, you will see the hatred written all over that face. And you will know for absolute sure there's no doubt. The battle of Gog and Magog. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints. Here they come to the holy city. And the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now again, remember we are dealing with a chiasm in Revelation over here. So the events are written in reverse. So we've got the fire coming down before there is a judgment. We just have to read it backwards. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And the Bible defines that for us, which is the second death, which is the death of total separation, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Remember all the questions you had about that? Extet, to finality. Christ comes, he judges, and after that final judgment, everybody knows exactly why and wherefore and why they're not into, coming into the city and fire comes up and forever and ever there is this torment. Let's read. Revelation 20, 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose faith the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place for them. So Jesus' throne rises over the new Jerusalem. Revelation 20, 12. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Now they've already been destroyed previously, but we're actually reading backwards now. So now we'll see the real sequence of events. He sees the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. So now... You are not in the book of life. There's no record of your confessed sins here in heaven, and you have been removed from the book of life. Here are the books of your deeds, the book of remembrance of what you did. Everything is there. The books were opened, and another book which was the book of life, their names were not there. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. They have no Savior. They didn't accept Him. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. You see how it's written backwards? Here you have the resurrection, but there you already have the judgment. Do you see that? So we just read the events backwards because the chiasm points out the central theme of Revelation, the final confrontation. So the real sequence is there's a resurrection, and then there is a judgment. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. 
This is the second death. So the lake of fire is the second death. That's what it is. They die again. That's the definition of the lake of fire. Whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, which by definition is the second death. Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me ye, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, because there is no one else higher to swear to, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow. So those who refused to bow before, who worshipped His Royal Highness Prince Lucifer, will now have to bow to Prince Emmanuel, whether they like it or not. Every tongue shall swear, surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. They shall be ashamed. They will have to give an account for what they did. Romans 14, 11 says, For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Those in the city do it willingly, with a joyful heart. Those outside the city do it reluctantly, with a hateful heart. But they do it. They have no choice. That the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. So the second resurrection does not give them a second chance. They just receive a judgment, and then they are destroyed. Job 21.30. So that's the battle of Gog and Magog. Magog means, Gog and Magog means conceal. All their life they have propagated a lie, false religion, half-truths, deceived the people of God. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. Satan in his desperation thinks, I can still take the city, Revelation 29. So they surround it. But then the Bible says, Revelation 22, 9, fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So that final act of rebellion, when the every knee bows, suddenly is a final act, and everybody in the city sees the true intent of the heart, and fire comes down from heaven and devours them and destroys them. Into smoke shall they consume away, Psalms 37, 20. The fire shall devour them, Psalms 21, 9. Either that is true, or the doctrine of hell is true, or one of the two. They can't both be right. This is the second death, Revelation 20, 14. And these shall go away into, now listen carefully, everlasting punishment but the righteous into life eternal, Matthew 25, 46. We must know that when the Bible speaks about the everlasting, it is the consequences that it talks about, not the actual event. The fire is not everlasting. I certainly wouldn't like to live on an earth made new where fire is constantly coming down, consuming everything. The fire devours them, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name, Revelation 14, 11. How does a text like that fit into this model that we've just expounded, where everything leads to a total destruction? How does that happen? Well, let's look at the parallel text. Psalms 92, 7. Let's study what the Bible means when it says forever. We need to know this. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. Psalms 92 verse 7. So, the forever deals with the what? With the destruction that is eternal not the destroying process wherein they are alive to feel the pain forever and ever. No. The wicked are destroyed forever. 
the consequences of the destruction are forever and ever and ever. Let's read another one, Isaiah 34, 8 to 10. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. That's the final conflict. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched, night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste, none shall pass through it forever and ever. Do you see the, the writing there? Now this can be confusing if you do not study all the parallels. What does this mean? The fire will not be quenched. What is this unquenchable fire? Is it hell going on forever and ever? Jude 7 says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. This fire that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, is it still burning? But Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed for how long? forever and ever and ever and ever. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that should live ungodly. So this is the example, and this is what it means forever and ever. Have we any other texts? Let's look. Jeremiah 17, 27, regarding the unquenchable fire. But if you will not hearken unto me to hallow my Sabbath day, isn't that interesting? So that is an issue. And not to bear a burden, even entering into the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. There is Jeremiah speaking about the destruction that will come upon Jerusalem, and he says the Lord will punish particularly this irreverence with regard to his law, of which the Sabbath is the authoritative law, and he says this fire shall not be quenched. There's the example of the unquenchable fire. Let's pick up the parallels. Jeremiah 52, 12 to 13, now in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, which was the nineteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar, captain of the guard, which served the king of Babylon into Jerusalem, and burned the house of the Lord. Aha! And the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, and all the houses of the great men burned with fire. And there's the fulfillment of it. This is what he predicted, and he called it a what? An unquenchable fire. Now, in 2 Chronicles 36, 19 to 21, it reads, And they burnt the house of God, referring to that event, and broke down the walls of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof, and them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the words of the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Now do you understand the unquenchable fire? Is the fire still burning in the gates of the temple, yes or no? But the consequences were unquenchable. It was not to be altered. It was going to be like that forever and ever. So at the end of time, when God destroys and the unquenchable fire comes, how long will it burn? As long as, burn. as long as it has something to burn. And they will be gone, the wicked. For behold, Malachi 4.1, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly, and this is called the what type of fire? Unquenchable fire. The extent forever and ever and ever. So all the proud and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. 
And the day that cometh shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. So how much of them is going to burn away? All of them. And how long will it burn? Until they are gone. And how long will they remain gone then? Forever and ever and ever. There's no hell. There's no God like that who punish forever and ever and ever with uh, eternal pain. There's no such God. And ye shall tread down the wicked. They shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. Malachi 4.3 So the holy city must be divinely protected during this event, and it burns until everything is gone. And then you can come out of the city and walk on this earth, and everything will be what? Ashes under your feet. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. 2 Peter 2, 9. That takes part, place after the millennium. Now what happens to the devil? He hasn't had any death yet, right? I will destroy thee, O covering cherub. Therefore will I bring forth a fire in the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth. Ezekiel 28, 16 to 18. So what's going to happen to the devil and his angels? It's going to burn up until there's nothing left. There will be no more demons around. There will be only good angels and the righteous that are saved. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. So the throne of heaven is going to be moved to where? To the earth. And the earth is going to be the center of the universe. Not some insignificant little spot somewhere. And God himself shall be with them and be their God, and they shall see his face. Revelation 21, 3, 22, 4. You can see God face to face. You won't be destroyed by any brightness because you will be like him, says the Bible. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Revelation 21, 1. So what is Jesus going to do? He's going to say, let there be. Wow, I want to be there. I want to see it. I want to see it. I want to see this reconstruction. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness, 2 Peter 3, 13. We're going to live on this planet as ghosts sitting on a cloud going, pling, 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 pling. Boring. No wonder nobody wants to go to heaven. I wouldn't want to sit on cloud nine playing my harp forever and ever as a ghost. I know. The heaven, the new world, is going to be me. Not with this pathetic body of mine, but something special. After the millennium, God will recreate the heavens and the earth. So the holy city descends after the millennium. Satan attacks. The wicked are destroyed. The devil and his angels are destroyed, and the earth is made new. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Interesting. Revelation 21, 1. You could say the sea is nations. We're all going to be one. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that this ocean that was full of sharks and things will revert back to the beautiful, huge inland water masses and the great rivers and beautiful scenery that goes along with it. Whichever way you like it, eye has not seen nor ear has heard what's going to go on. And all the animals will return to their original design purpose back into harmony with a death-free ecosystem. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. And a little child will lead. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. Isaiah 65, 23. We're going to be ghosts. We're going to be recreated beings. For behold, I create a new heaven. The former shall not be remembered nor come to mind, Isaiah 65, 17. Not because you cannot remember, 
because Jesus will have the marks in his hands as a guarantee and a witness to what has happened and our mind is not going to be cleared so that we don't remember for what would be the purpose of this great battle then and a decision for righteousness. Oh no, we'll remember. But the beauty and the peace and the serenity will take away the remembrance of everything that was sad and you will become gloriously happy in heaven and they shall build houses and inhabit them and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them and they shall not build and another inhabit and they shall not plant and another eat mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands Isaiah 65 21 22 I cannot wait for this day Amen. do you know how many houses I've been involved in and in how many houses I've lived and every time some other guy gets it every house that I've ever been in my wife is my witness I've planted an avocado pear tree I love avocados I've never eaten one yet <laughs> drives me nuts the other guy who gets my house I drive past them somewhere he's a beautiful avocado tree full of avocados and I would be stealing if I took one won't happen here I'll build a house and I will have my own tree and you're invited to come and eat but leave me one <laughs> and you know what we're gonna have two houses one that the Lord built are we all going to live under one roof? No. In my father's house are many mansions. We're going to have beautiful city dwellings. And then we're going to have a country dwelling where we will plant and where we will be human beings. I'm so glad I won't be a ghost. I'm so glad. And there we shall enjoy the work of our hands. And if you want to consult the great architect the real one not the false one and you can say Lord how, how should I do this he'll tell you but you know your taste everything that you like it'll go in there you will not lose your individuality look around you and look at the differences between you and you will see that God is a lover of variety they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains says the Lord Isaiah 65 25 and all the old laws will apply and all the boundaries will go away all those fences this will be my peace yes that'll be your peace but if I'm strolling towards the city and I happen to stroll past your land am I allowed to eat something on your land yes. oh yes that's the biblical way you were allowed to eat on the way to anywhere you were going but you weren't allowed to harvest the other man's fields what a beautiful fair system there you can walk, no animal is restricted, the elephants, the whatever is going to come right up to you in the morning and give you a kiss. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 8, 11. There will be many. The Bible says that they will stand with the 144,000, all those that come together. The 144,000 is not a literal figure because he looked around, he heard the number, but he saw a great multitude that no one can count. It stands for the number 12,000 out of all the tribes, every single one of them, and it is a spiritual figure standing for the great wholeness of the redeemed. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me says the Lord Isaiah 66 23 so you will be working in your fields maybe you will become a representative to a planet way out there to expound to them the greatness of the Lord because the Lord says you are made for his glory so you will represent God and the greatness of God to the universe Plus you will have your own dwelling and every Sabbath we come together in the city and once a month when there is a new moon we come together and the Bible says 
that the tree of life bears its fruit once a month, twelve kinds of fruits, in case you get bored with that type of fruit. There's even variety. And the leaves are for the healings of the nations. Isn't that great? We're going to make, I don't know what, maybe the leaves taste like carrot chocolate or something, just nicer. 